Okay, students, uh, welcome back to uh, astronomy lecture. Has anybody taken a look at the uh, Nights Under the Sky, Nights Under the Stars website this morning? Is it it's set for Thursday? It's really nice weather. Right. Now. What's what color is it? Yellow. No color yet. All right. Uh, boy, if it was tonight, I looked at the weather report this morning, a lot of dry air over, on top of us right now, but 48 hours from now, boy, it's anybody's guess. So, um, let's keep going. I'm, I want to talk, um, a little bit about a really, really nice, uh, article that I found in Scientific American. Uh, which you you can use, you can read through the UCF library website uh, fairly easily. Um, it's in the extra readings page. Here's what it looks like when you get there. Um, this is actually an HR diagram. I need my cursor up there. There you go. This is actually an HR diagram. Uh, and the nice thing about this HR diagram is it has... Um, uh, spectral types across the top and then absolute magnitude on the right side vertically. So we put our absolute magnitude over on the left side, but um, anyway, so you'll be able to relate it. Now this is an enormous H-star diagram, quite a few stars mapped on there. Here's the actual title of it. Uh, don't bother copying this down, but do look at it. Uh, the Periodic Table of the Cosmos by Ken Croswell, Scientific American, July 2011, and there's a link to it in the readings page. It's uh, it's nice, and it'll actually um, help you prepare for the exam. Uh, here's a little bit of a close-up on it, and actually, this will lead us into our topic for today. Down here on the bottom, I don't know if you can tell, but these are, they, they have the temperature ratings down here. It's kind of small. Uh, up here are the spectral types. Uh, over here is absolute magnitude. So sun is right here in the middle of this chart. Right here is the SUN. Here's the main sequence. Uh, and if you haven't figured it out, uh, exam three is going to be main sequence city. Everything that we've been doing um, since the last exam has been designed to analyze and think about this diagram. All right, here's the sun down here. And you can see when you get in and take a close-up look at it, they graphed out and labeled everything. Now, I told you guys not to, although I think a few of you did, and I, a, few, a few of you did it pretty nicely, so I can't complain too much. But they did that. And here's the sun. I don't know, where's... Uh, Here's Zeta Reticuli, that's a famous star. Uh, uh, Eta Butis. Procyon, here's Procyon up here. Uh, Beta Cassiopeia, uh, that's in the constellation Cassiopeia. Here's some giant stars up here, and all the way up here is Betelgeuse. Now, uh, we want to talk about Betelgeuse today. Uh, but in, in this uh, particular article, here's a, this is a good quote. This is, a, this is uh, your pull quote from the very beginning of the article. Or actually, this is from the very end of the article. Because we're going to be talking about supernova explosions. And this is what this pull quote, this is the money quote. Light from the next Milky Way, supernova, is racing toward us right now, we think. When it finally arrives, astronomers will plot the progenitor's position, in other words, the star that became a supernova explosion, and they'll plot the progenitor's position on the HR diagram to understand its life and its death. And that, in one sentence, or two sentences, uh, explains why uh, we are emphasizing the HR diagram, because we want to understand stars as they exist on the main sequence, and how the heck do they get off the main sequence? 
I mean, assuming that everything that we see dipped over here to the upper right, these giants and super giants, uh, were originally down here on the main sequence. And these dwarf stars down here, these white dwarfs, uh, supposedly they were at one point on the main sequence. But how do you get off the main sequence? That's what we're going to talk about today. Matter of fact, this article, he does discuss Betelgeuse, the supergiant, how it evolved, and how it will end. Um, in other words, he discusses the supernova and the supernova process. So um, just make a note, it's, it's in the extra readings page on web courses, and it's a nifty, nice little study review to get you thinking about HR diagram in a slightly different manner than me up here running my mouth for an hour and a half every Tuesday and Thursday. All right, he's got a slightly different perspective on it. And I'm not shy about saying that, that there's other people that are much smarter about the HR diagram and pretty much any other topic. All right. Now let me uh, pause for questions before we continue. Well, I just lost 20 bucks, Brandon. And I bet Brandon that somebody would do something. Before I got to this point, uh, let's take a couple questions using the eye clicker just to get your brain kind of warmed up and to think about days of future past. What chapter did we start? Lecture A19. We're on frequency AA. Go ahead and vote. This should be easy. This graphic is actually a slide from Lecture A19, March the 22nd. 15 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All right, let's see what you guys voted for. Incredibly, uh, there's a split of opinion here. Uh, and actually, the answer is right there on the screen right here, 12, figure 12, 3. Yeah, so chapter 12 is where we began our discussion. Remember, the whole thing about parallax to me is if you can get parallax, you can get a luminosity. You can figure out the absolute magnitude, and that's the, that's the thing we need to construct a color luminosity chart, the HR diagram. Uh, so I, we hit that really hard. Here's another question for you. This one's a little harder. You might have to think about it. Ten seconds to vote. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Let's see. Whoa. 
Very surprising. Actually, so that means this is good. Uh, we've got a split of opinion here. 20% uh, for option A. Yes. Some stuff from chapter Ocho. 11% uh, for option B. No. Only chapter 12. Uh, whoa, good eyes. 64% of you uh, voted for chapter 5. Uh, and uh, yeah, this one here. This is the Wien displacement law. We have some a big homework assignment. Make sure that you review your practice of that. Um, you can't run it anymore if you didn't use all your attempts on it. Uh, but if you did make any attempts on it, you'll still be able to at least study it. And if you feel uh, unconfident uh, about this area of Chapter 5, uh, go back and study it. And if you want help with the calculation... And you want to make sure that you see, I can't tell you what's on the test. But if you do feel like you want to be sharp about the calculation method for the test, post a discussion thread. If you know, it, uh, oh, come to office hours tomorrow. You know, you know how many people I've had to office hours this year for this class? One. One. My other class, I have dozens of students. I have students track me down here and there around campus, but all formal office hours. And of course, here's the other thing. We're never going to stop talking about the SUN. It's the nearest star. It's our star. It's the one that we can see most easily, the one that we can model most reliably. Uh, and so um, we're never going to, I mean, if you're in astronomy, no matter if you're talking about the Big Bang Theory or planets, or anything in between. I mean, the, the biggest scale theory that we have is the Big Bang Theory. That's, and I know a lot about that. Planetary theory, you know, the, the moons of Jupiter and Saturn and all that stuff. I don't know, Jack. I don't know very much about that stuff. But anywhere in between, you're always going to be referring to something about the SUN. I mean, it's just the, the way it is. So it's always good to keep that stuff in mind. Questions? Yes. Uh, the uh, the uh, Wien displacement law that'll be in match. If you need it, it'll be in matching. That's how I do it. Remember? Okay. Try not to screw up the minus signs. No. So, yeah. did you do some of the exercises in the homework? Yeah. Yeah, just go back. And if you didn't do the homework, it wasn't like a ginormous homework. So if you didn't do it, it's not going to kill your grade. But you might want to, it's, it's good to know and get squared away with those calculations. So if you didn't do it, and I'm not looking at it, I'm, I'm not looking at anybody. But if you, in the sound of my voice, did not do it, find somebody that did, make friends with them, and maybe you can study from theirs and they can coach you through on it. Another question. Still students coming in. So actually, my bet is not. Yeah, question. Yes. Yes, I won my bet. I bet, Brandon, that somebody would ask me what chapters to study. And we just went through it, my friend. So that was my way of, you know, preventing. Yeah, so that's, so Brandon, you owe me 20 bucks now. All right, let's talk about Betelgeuse. <laughs> and students in a lot of astronomy books and articles and stuff, uh, main sequence is frequently abbreviated MS. Um, here's a diagram 
Uh, this is actually from chapter 12. And we're going to dip forward into chapter 13 just a little bit today. Okay? Because we're going to talk about what the heck Betelgeuse is doing. Betelgeuse is out here. Okay? And presumably it started somewhere over here, maybe. So here's um, Beta Centauri. Uh, here's Vega down here, Sirius. So supposedly Betelgeuse, before it became a red giant out here and discombobulated all of its fusion reactions, um, it start, probably started somewhere in here on the main sequence. A little bit above Achernar, which is about six times the mass of the sun, and a little bit below Spica, which is about ten times the mass of the sun. We think Betelgeuse is about 7.7 .7 times the mass of the sun. You might want to write that down. The mass of Betelgeuse is about 7.7. .7. Now, here's what happens. We think if, if you're a star and you have a lot of mass, a lot of hydrogen, okay, all stars, mainly hydrogen, then that changes the conditions at the core. So instead of a proton proton chain. Now the sun is burning hydrogen, as we say. It's fusing hydrogen into nuclei of helium-4. Um, that's its main energy production chain reaction. So number one, proton-proton chain, that's the SUN. And many stars like the sun. And all the little teeny red stars in the main sequence are running the proton-proton chain reaction for the most part. But if your overall mass is really big, the core conditions uh, change significantly. In other words, you get higher pressure and higher temperatures. And under, if it's sufficiently high temperature, sufficiently high pressure, different nuclear reactions will start to cook off. Now, I'll give you an a, uh, analogy that you can jot down as a side note. It's not in the slide here, but in, in my main outline here, but you can add this as a side note to 2C. If you're in the kitchen, if you, you know, like, you know, your mom might say, get out of the kitchen, you know. But if, if you have a license to operate in the kitchen, and do something other than, you know, nuking something in the microwave. If you ever bake something in the oven. Or if you ever use, you know, you make, you know, like you use a crock pot. Okay. You've got chemical reactions going. For instance... If you set the crock pot to make, you know, barbecued ribs, you know, you just slow cook them and just, you know, fall off a bone. Then, oh man, I didn't have lunch yet. Why did I bring that up? Uh, uh, so if you're, you're making some stuff in the crock pot, some barbecue ribs fall off the bone. You look at them and they fall off the bone. That's at uh, atmospheric pressure, normal atmospheric pressure. So it takes eight hours, you know, at low temperature, atmospheric pressure. But another way to make ribs is to put them in a pressure cooker. Okay, so make a note. Analogy, cooking. Example, crock pot versus uh, pressure cooker. If you put something in the pressure cooker and you cook it, then you can get those ribs fall off the bone uh, in a lot shorter time because it's under pressure. So that it accelerates and probably uh, permits other chemical reactions and it accelerates the normal chemical reactions that cause the cartilage or whatever it is that binds the, the muscles to the bone uh, in those ribs to fall apart. 
That chemical reaction is caused by heat. In the crock pot, it takes eight hours. In a pressure cooker, it might take half an hour. I don't know. I'm going to have to get a pressure cooker. I used to have one, but they're pretty dangerous. Uh, second, if you've ever baked, raise your hand if you've ever baked bread or watched your mom bake bread. Okay, there's a bunch of you. Uh, baked, if you do your own bread, it's really the best. But it's not easy. And it can blow up in your face if you don't do the yeast right and you don't let the yeast rise. Now, there's a couple ways to do it. The yeast rising, it, it generates CO2. The yeast generates CO2, and that's what causes all the little pockets inside bread that causes it to, to rise, expands, and get those little, you know how bread looks like it's a bunch of little, you know, cells of air, you know, like foam almost. And the different texture depends on, you know, how delicious it is and stuff like that. So when you're, when you're uh, baking bread, you've got to do the chemical reactions right, and you can't do that phase of it in the oven because the, the temperature is not right. You'll kill the yeast. It won't work. Okay, the yeast need room temperature, right, for them to do their thing. And then you put it in the oven, and it'll continue, you know, cooking like that, right? So that's another example, an algae. Uh, so this is 2C, Roman numeral, small Roman numeral II, second an algae, baking bread. If the conditions are not right, you cannot do it, okay? It will not work. The whole bread baking process. And the same thing inside of a star, except actually a star is much easier. It's a very simple uh, environment. It, we can't reproduce it. We can't make it here on Earth. But it's not that hard. It, you've got a, a certain amount of mass. And once you know the mass of a star, you pretty much know everything. So when you look at the HR diagram and you think, okay, Spike is about 10 times the mass of the sun. And Asher and R is about six times the mass of the sun. Once you know the mass of a star on the main sequence, once you place it on the main sequence, you know its mass. And even if you've triangulated it and its binary partner, you can get the mass that way. Um, once you've got that mass, you basically know everything about that star. It's like it's DNA. So your DNA is amazingly complex. Any biology majors in here? One, two. Did you guys study DNA yet? The genome? It's, it, the genome, the human genome is ginormous. And apparently they've made some kind of artificial bacterium uh, with like 340 genes or something like that. 345. Did you, did you read that article? Some, some guy that's got a research project making artificial life. And it's, it's all, it reads almost like a scary monster movie, to tell you the truth. But he's made this artificial form of life with 345 genes, or whatever the count is. It's in the low hundreds. But us humans, it's zillions. Okay, very complex DNA. And apparently a lot of our DNA, nobody knows what it does. We got a lot, of, some people think we, and some people even think we have junk DNA, that, that every time we get infected by a virus, the virus injects some, some genes into our, our DNA, and then we pass that on. I'm not sure if, if that's how it works. I basically am clueless about biology. But I do know that there's a lot of genomes. For a star, it's one. One genome. It's mass. You know that, you basically. You know, it's like the mass of a star is like the DNA of a human. If you, if you have DNA, if you know the DNA, you get it all you know, figured out and everything, you know, for that person, you know, before they're even born, they're, you know, what their fingerprints are going to be. I mean, theoretically, how heavy they're going to be when they're one year old, when they're 12 years old, when they're 80 years old. You know how long their lifespan, you know what their color of their hair is, the color of their eyes, the complexion of their skin. You know, what, you know like Will Smith, he's got those big Dumbo ears that come out like that. You know, and that's why he's so smart, because he hears so much. And of course, that's what he says. But 
you know, even the shape of your ears, your earlobe, your nose, you know. And I bet if I took a picture of you and your dad and your M.O.M. and maybe your mom's mom and your mom's dad and your dad's dad, your dad's mom, I would see a lot of noses that look similar, a lot of chins, a lot of eyes. So all that stuff is in your DNA. And us humans, you know, we're amazing. You know, the human, the living creatures are amazingly complex. Stars, just one. The mass, that's it. That's all you got to know. You get all of it, it, its life cycle, how it's going to die. Unless it gets rammed by another star or something like that. But, you know, that's like a, a traffic accident, I guess, in the cosmos. But yeah, if you know the mass, that's it. You think I'm going to ask you a question about the mass of a star and its DNA on exam three? Yeah, I might. I'm ranting about it right now. I'm getting excited about it. Anyway, so here we are. The special cooking recipe in a high mass star at the center. All right, now we've got a pressure cooker. Okay, so we're not in the crock pot anymore. The sun, crock pot, analogy, proton, proton chain, nice. You get those helium nuclei, no problem. You get the ribs to fall off the bone, no problem in the slow cooker, the crock pot. But in a big star, you get the same effect. You get those ribs to fall off the bone, but a lot faster. And we think that the fusion chain reaction in the high mass stars features the CNO cycle. That's the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen cycle. Now, in the proton proton chain, you get four protons going in and you get a helium 4 nucleus out. And in the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen cycle, the CNO cycle, we think you get the same result. But under those conditions, in the presence of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, a slightly new uh, recipe starts to fire up the CNO cycle. And that's this diagram. Now, in a regular star, the, the crock pot, uh, you get a hydrogen in and... Here's another hydrogen coming in down here. Here's one over here in the blue. Here's one down here in the orange. Here's one up here in the uh, purple. And here's another one up here in the orange. Um, those four hydrogens going in basically give you a helium-4 nucleus. All right? And so this is, this is kind of a synopsis in the middle of the proton-proton chain and the carbon-nitrogen-oxygen cycle. So here we go. Step one you bang into a nitrogen, all right? And then the output is a carbon over here in the yellow, step two. And a bunch of smithereens over here. Another hydrogen slams in in step three, and you're back to nitrogen. But it's nitrogen 14. This one up here uh, is nitrogen 13, all right? Up here in step one. Down here in step three, three, all right, you've cooked up a nitrogen 14. Bang, another hydrogen. There's all kinds of hydrogen flying around in here. It's high pressure, high temperature. They're really motating. You got a lot of kinetic energy, a lot of momentum, and bang, you're going to cook up uh, a, a lot of new nuclei. Here's an oxygen, oxygen 15. Now, that's not a stable isotope, so it undergoes another fusion reaction. What do we got? Nitrogen 15. Okay, it go, undergoes a decay, right? Because the, the three stable isotopes, see, now we're going back even further than the chapter on the sun. We're going back to exam one. Carb the, the isotopes, oxygen 17, oxygen 16, oxygen 17, oxygen 18. Those are the stable ones. This one here is step five, or at the end of step four, oxygen 15, not stable. It decays in step five quickly into a 15 uh, nitrogen, and then bam, another hydrogen slams in, and now you've got a stable isotope of carbon. So make a note of that. Carbon. Carbon 12. 
the carbon 12 in your cheeseburger, the carbon in your monster, or what do they call that stuff? No, not Red Bull. Well, Red Bull has a lot of sugar in it. No, what are those things you get at like uh, uh, Dunkin' Donuts, and it's most it's like dessert, but it's a uh, it's uh, a it's not a latte, but it's a uh, frappuccino. If you see, because I never get them, so I see people consuming them. Frappuccino, sugar, protein, caffeine. I guess caffeine probably has a bunch of carbon in it. Just guessing. Yeah, that's all made inside of a star. Did you hear what I just said? Are you awake? The carbon in your earlobe was made inside of a star. The CO2 that you're exhaling as you snore in class. The carbon in the CO2 was made inside of a star. In this, or a similar, you know, there's other reactions. But this is a heavier element. And that's what happens. That is how you are made of calcium. Phosphorus. You can't live without phosphorus. You can't live without iodine. You can't live without a lot of stuff. I mean, you can live without uranium, so we don't really need the uranium. But I mean, we got to have a lot of carbon, oxygen, I mean, carbohydrates. You can't live without sugar, at least some people think that. But everything above hydrogen and helium, yeah, it's made in some kind of a pressure cooker like this. All right? And so not only are carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen um, being manufactured, they're actually kind of like a catalyst. They help the reaction flow. Right? If there weren't any carbon or nitrogen or oxygen, a different chain reaction would prevail. But we think this is the one that prevails inside of a large star. All right. So here's your bottom line. New reactions, CNO cycle, and as a result, your star is going to move. It's going to retire from the main sequence. You know, the main sequence is your working lifetime. You know, you're, a star is born. You know, a little baby, when he's born, takes his first breath. Star, when it's born, nukes off its first helium nucleus. Starts that nuclear fusion reaction in the core. That's the beginning of a star, it's the birth of a star, we think. And when they retire, they're still fusing stuff, but they move to a new location on the HR diagram. And that's why Betelgeuse, if you map it out, is somewhere up here. Now this is a uh, diagram mm, 13.5, I think. It's around page 343. So make a note, 343, HR diagram. And this one doesn't have um, a 7.7 .7 mass star. It has a 9 mass, 25 times the mass of the sun, and 100 times the mass, no, 40 times the mass of the sun, and 85 times the mass. So really massive stars are going to be up here. And you know with a crock pot, those ribs are done fast. Same thing with these stars. If you start up here, on the main sequence, you're going to be done. And this down here where the sun is, go ahead and make a note of this. The sun's lifetime on the main sequence, approximately 10 billion years, we think. Our best models indicate that. And from other evidence, we know that the sun formed approximately 4.5 billion years ago. And so the sun is about halfway through its its main sequence lifetime. But it's eventually going to retire and move off, you know, move to Florida. Okay? So here's a bunch of high mass stars 
moving off to Florida. They're retiring, retiring down to Del Boca Vista or whatever, you, you know, some other place. Okay, and so they, so th the fact that they're out here means we're not talking crock pot at atmospheric pressure. We're still cooking stuff, but it's under a pressure cooker. So things are going to be different. Luminosity is going to be different. To surface temperature is going to be different. Look at these guys. This one here, at about nine times the mass of the sun, on the main sequence, it's going to be a blue star, HOT. It's going to be a B or an O down here, right? But eventually, and not very, you know, it doesn't take very long, it'll start acquiring those conditions at the core where carbon, nitrogen, and, and other exotic fusion cycles begin to occur. And when that happens, it'll move off the main sequence. All right? So Betelgeuse, if we mapped it in on this diagram, would be somewhere down in here in this area. All right? Now, let's, let me pause for questions. Yes. The question is for the H, your HR diagram. Uh, the plan is yes for me to give you guys your HR diagram for use on exam three. Okay. And if I'm not done with everybody's, I'll give everybody an HR diagram that I really like. So it could be, it could be anybody's HR diagram, and I've seen some nice ones. Okay, uh, so that's the fallback if I don't get, which is a possibility. It's but theoretically, I'd like to get everybody their own HR diagram. All right, question. What is your name again? Christian, what's your last name? Sibit, S I B B I T, two T's. Christian Sibit. If I were to answer that question, Christian was asking me, "Well, how does how do the white dwarfs? You know, that, that's the stuff down here. How, you know, to answer that would take me to the material that we're going to start study next Tuesday. So we're doing high mass stars, but I mean. White dwarfs come out of this area down here, okay, and some of these up here. But we're not gonna. We're just gonna talk about the first step of retirement. This is uh, this is the graveyard down here. White dwarfs, okay, because they're not fusing. They're not. They're not breathing anymore down there. They're not really fusing. Okay. All right. Here's some reactions. Take a look at this. All right. So try to jot these down. This is a diagram from your textbook. Chapter 13. Uh, but not, this is a very small set of pages in Chapter 13. Around page 343, plus or minus one or two pages. Um, this is uh, another reaction. Now, this is not part of the CNO cycle, per se. This is a helium-4 nucleus fusing with a carbon. All right, so carbon-12, helium-4, the net is 16, and you have eight protons and eight neutrons. And my wonderful students, that is stable, oxygen 16. That is what you are breathing right now. It was made inside of a big star. It's incredible to think about. You know that the stuff you're breathing now used to be in a burning, seething cauldron of intense heat and radiation and pressure that you would even to experience a millionth of it you'd be totally incinerated but now that carbon and h2o that's hydrogen excuse me oxygen and h2o is hydrogen and a little bit of oxygen that's the water of life but when it was first formed in the fiery furnace of a star. All right, here's a helium-4 fusing with an oxygen-16. And you get another element, neon-20. 
And it's kind of interesting, every time a helium-4... See, look at this series of steps. You start with a 12, you get a 16. Start with a 16, you get a 20. Start with a 20, slam in another helium-4 nucleus, and you get a 24, magnesium. And you know what's kind of cool? We have found, and when we study the abundances of the elements, that there's a lot of these guys, and the stuff that's in between 21, 22, 23, is not as abundant. doesn't have the same abundance. Okay, so we see a lot of the 16s, a lot of the 20s, and a lot of the 24s, the magnesiums and the neon 20s and the oxygen 16s. It's not, a, it's not a coincidence that there's not much oxygen 17 and oxygen 18. It's because of this. It's made in the center of a star. And that means that a lot of it is made by absorbing a helium nucleus. And a helium nucleus is H4, HE4, a helium-4 nucleus. So you bump four steps on the periodic table, four steps to the right each time. Here's another set. This is even heavier. All right now, this is a super-duper fusion reaction. Check this one out. All right, here's a heavy... Starting with carbon-12, but now, let's say that inside this star, um, the conditions are right for a, uh, oxygen-16, nice and stable, to fuse with a carbon-12, also stable. Bang! You get a silicon-28. Your telephone is loaded with silicon. The beach over at Cocoa Beach is silicon dioxide. It's sand. It was all made here. This is where it was made. Inside of a star. Let's look at this reaction. Two oxygen 16s. You get a, a neutron out and a 31S. That's sulfur. So the smelly, stinky smell of hydrogen sulfide? Yeah. It started in the, the core of a star. A tw uh, two silicons smushing together. Now, make sure you write this one down. 28 silicon smushing into 28 silicon gives you a 56. Now, nucleus 56 is iron. And iron, my friends, is the very last fusion product that a star ordinarily makes before it goes into a supernova. Let me repeat that. Iron 56 is the last nucleus that a star will make before it goes into a supernova. And the reason for this is that Iron 56 will not give you bonus energy. Either way, if you fuse it with something or if you break it apart, fission reaction. Neither fission nor fusion will get you any bonus energy, extra energy. All these other ones, you get bonus energy. That's what this, that's what this, you know, this flare of light here is at the center of each of these reactions. You get a lot of energy out. That's why the sun is hot. You know, when you fuse two hydrogens, you produce energy, H-O-T. And everything up until this point is cooking and powering your star, giving it plenty of heat. This one, you can fuse it, but it'll actually cool down the star. It, it'll, it takes energy to fuse iron. You know, you can get stuff above iron, but it won't, it won't be a self-sustaining reaction. These ones are. And so iron, the iron core, it's kind of cool to think about the toughest element we have, iron. And it's the last thing that a star will make under normal conditions. Make a side note to yourself. Stuff above iron on the periodic table, we've got it. Gold is above, the peri above iron on the periodic table, silver. But if you look in the center of a star under normal conditions, you'd be forced to say, silver and gold have I none. There's no silver or gold inside of a normal star. 
Iron is, a, is as high as you get on the periodic table. Now here's another cool thing about it. If you study the thermodynamics, they develop uh, layers. And, and down here at the core, that'll be your hottest area. And your highest level reaction will be happening in the core. Now this diagram, also from chapter 13, is, it, it displays the fact that the iron core is inert. It's not really fusing. It's not cooking itself. Now these other areas, these shells, yeah, here's silicon fusion, okay, that produces iron. This green area, that's oxygen, neon, and magnesium. And then here's carbon fusion in this dark gray area. And this next pink area here, what is that, helium fusion? And then outside of that, hydrogen fusion. Okay, so here's the, here's the crock pot out here. You still have the crock pot proton-proton reactions and the CNO cycles. They don't go away. They're just way far out. And that's why these stars get really big. There's a lot of heat produced if it's a really uh, big amount of mass. And you start getting all these exotic reactions down here. Right? And once that iron core forms, that's when you get this. Type 2 supernova. And type 2 supernova and Charles, right? You're Charles. I know you're Charles. Christian. Christian? Type 2 supernova and white dwarfs we'll talk about next Tuesday. All right? So, We'll finish with the story of Betelgeuse, the different layers of exotic reactions. But the end of Betelgeuse as a supernova, we'll talk about that next Tuesday. Okay, let's dismiss early. And your homework is simply to prepare for exam three. And I'll see you guys on Thursday, if not sooner.